Hello and welcome to Fresh Perspectives. My name is Gail and uh, maybe you remember a couple of years back I had um, a woman and her daughter on to talk. Uh, um, Jackie and Alicia Cannon came on to talk about their trips to Spain. Well today uh, we have Jackie's husband on. His name is Randy Cannon and um, he is one of those guys that managed to continue working uh, throughout the coronavirus uh, pandemic, um, but we're doing his work at home. Uh, I'd like you to meet Randy Cannon. Hello, Gail. Uh, thank you uh, for having me on the show today. Uh, thank you for coming on. And Randy um, has been able to work at home. He works uh, for Chautauqua Abstract. And um, so he's here to talk about some uh, historical things that have to do with your job. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Um, now, were you going to um, start out by uh, talking about the Holland Land Company, was it? Yes, yep, yep. Um, and what I thought I'd start out today is most people, uh, they have a deed for their house, and the deed usually has a description of their property boundaries and things like that. And oftentimes there's what they call a header or a preamble of the deed which has identifying marks of the Holland Land Company survey. So if someone's got their deed, most people in Chautauqua County have this information on their deed and uh, it's usually identified by lot, town, and range or something like that. So I wanted to kind of start out by kind of explaining really what that meant uh, so people can have an understanding of where that came from. And, uh, and those identifiers, you have to understand that prior to 1800, Chautauqua County was a wilderness. Oh, sure. It was a frontier. It was unsettled. Uh, you know, it was what they considered the colonies. They were more East Coast. But this part of the state was very much remote. And Robert Morris uh, was really the one that kind of acquired the land. Uh, Robert Morris of the Revolutionary War mm -hmm. fame okay. acquired this land and they saw potential in it. He as, acquired the entire county's worth of land? And, and much more. Basically it would be anything, and we're going to get into this a little bit later, from the Genesee River all the way to Lake Erie. And he also had lands south of the New York PA border. He was granted this land sort of in uh, repayment of his contributions to the Revolutionary War uh, cause. Oh, okay. And so he had this land, of course, uh, most of, as people will realize, most people that uh, s supported the Revolutionary War uh, took a toll on them financially afterwards, and a lot of them were broke or penniless, and Robert Morris was one of those people. He never really got to see the profits of inv his investment. And so oh, about uh, 17, 95, there was a group of investors from Amsterdam, from Holland, oh. mm -hmm. that kind of were looking for investment opportunities and uh, started out with a group of four individuals and it kind of grew to six. And they formed this uh, company called the Holland Land Company. And their idea was to kind of invest in these kind of wild regions and uh, kind of get an idea of what they had and what they could potentially do with it. So when they acquired the land from Robert Morris, and again, we're talking, you know, about 3.3 million acres, if you can imagine okay. that. Okay, so yeah. uh, did they pay him for the uh, land? Yes. Is that how that was? Yes, okay. it, 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 he, they purchased the land, and of course, again, it was fairly cheap because he had to liquidate it, and so they ended up not probably paying what we considered value at that time. But once they got this land, they immediately want to turn around and start investing and selling. Of course, the question became, what is that land? What land do we have? How far does it go? What are the boundaries? What's the soil like? The climate, things like that. And so they enlisted a man called Joseph Ellicott was his name. Joseph Ellicott. Joseph Ellicott, yep. And so if you're familiar with the town of Ellicott or yes. Ellicottville, yeah. Uh, yeah. it was obviously named for him. And so they hired him to basically determine the boundary lines of the Howland Land Company. Now, he was famous also for determining where exactly the New York, Pennsylvania border was. There was some question at time whether Presque Isle was in Pennsylvania 
or in New York State, and so oh. he was also instrumental in that. He also was the first one to take the measurements of Niagara Falls, oh. as far as the height of the falls and the width of the Niagara River and things like that. And later on, and we won't touch on this as much. How do you get a measurement of the uh, height of the Very falls? carefully. I'm sure he didn't go over <laughs> a barrel. It sounds like a really dangerous job. Yeah, well, he, he, I don't know if he used some sort of estimations or things like that, but he was able to attain that. And then he was kind of also instrumental in the push for eventually what became the Erie Canal. Oh. And so he had a lot of projects going on there. And so they hired him to kind of take a survey of this area. Now, again, we're talking 3.3 million acres, so there was quite a bit of land involved. And he started this process. It basically took him about two years to get this done. He started in about 1797. And you can imagine what a monumental test, because not only are you surveying this county, but you're basically in, uh, surveying every county between Lake Erie and the Genesee River. And so I brought a map here oh, good. that would kind of give you an idea. And hopefully, um, I don't know if they can see that or not. I can move that over a little bit. Um, of course, it would help if I had it right side up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so this is kind of what it would look like. And of course, you can kind of see the general outline of um, where New York State is and where uh, the counties are and things like that and where the, where the division line would be between, the, um, between the, the counties and between where the survey was. So this is kind of an idea of what he surveyed. So again, about 3.3 million acres of land. Uh, it was rather a large project there. Uh, now, did he just survey as far as where the lighter color on the map is? Basically, where you can see, where's La there's Lake Erie, there's the Pennsylvania border, and here's the line kind of the de line of demarcation that went all the way up to basically Lake Ontario. And so from that period, from that area west to Lake Erie is what he was involved with surveying. And so you're oh, talking gosh. about Chautauqua, Cattaraugus, uh, Erie, Niagara, uh, part of Allegheny County, I imagine Orleans, uh, and uh, those counties in that area. And so that's kind of the project that he had to do. And so what he would do um, is they enlisted the help of what they call a surveyor's chain. Now, a surveyor's chain, think about it, uh, think of a giant dog chain, like a, for a run. And mm -hmm. obviously, they used something a little more uh, complicated than that, but they used a chain with links in it. Mm -hmm. And what they would do is each chain had 100 links in that chain. And so what they would do is when they would measure, things were in chains and links. Oh, gosh. So one chain equals 66 feet. Oh. And uh, each link is about 7.92 inches. And so if you couldn't get a complete chain out of something, you would say it was, say, five chains and 50 links. So basically, Five chains and 50 links. And 50 is the halfway mark. So each one's, now imagine they measured the entire county and counties like this oh, to gosh. get an idea of it. <laughs> and they didn't have the modern survey equipment that we no. have now. Yeah. And so they were, they were measured, and you can imagine the topographical challenges of the hills and the valleys and the creeks and the streams and things like that. So it's no wonder that it was a two-year process in doing that. So he went and he surveyed this entire what they call purchase for the idea of giving an idea of what the Holland Land Company owned at that time. And the, what they did was that information is he went and he drew up what they call a map. And this map, I believe, it was a quite a large map, it ended up being about 18 square feet. The map was 18, 18 square, square feet. feet. Well, you can imagine how large <laughs> yeah. it'd have to be yeah, I know. in order to see this. And so um, he then became what was known as their agent because they were still in Amsterdam and still in what they consider Holland and the Netherlands. Um, and he became responsible for kind of parceling off the land and selling it off. And so what they would do, and um, I'll show you the next map here. Um, is they divided the counties, and hopefully this shows up, into what's called a grid. And if you can see, most everything is square. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And so he divided up the map into kind of sub parcels. Um, each of these squares, I don't know if you can see it too well, each of these squares were about 60 chains by 60 chains. So each square was about 360 acres. Okay. And the idea was that obviously you'd be interested in getting people to farm it, to build industries, to build businesses and blacksmith shops and places like that so that you could sell the land off. So they would break up these chunks. Now, this is kind of where we get into that deed information because they had to have a way of identifying what quadrant, if you could say, you were in. So along the bottom, they would have range numbers. So like, for instance, range 15, 16, 17, or sorry, range 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, and 10. Mm -hmm. And on the side, they had town numbers. And um, let's see, I'm trying to see if it's got six, five, four, three, two, and one. Mm -hmm. And so you were, and then you can see within each one of these maps, there's little tiny numbers, and those were the lot numbers. So they identified, for instance, say for instance you were, now let's just pick French Creek here since it's over in the corner here. So there might be a lot uh, number 19 in Township 1 and Range 15. And that would tell you exactly on this map where that property would be located. And so they did that that way. And of course there were land barons back in those days that would buy up large tracts of land. Mm -hmm. And he was responsible for making sure that um, he got the people their land. Now, the land office, they tried to find an area that would be suitable for having the land office, and of course, they just settled on Batavia. Oh, now, okay. if you've ever been up in Batavia, there's a Holland Land Company museum oh. that you can go to, and they've got maps and the chains and things like that that they have displayed, and that was where their land office was. And they settled in Batavia in 1802 for their land office. Now, Mr. Ellicott, was their uh, agent from 1800 to 1821. And so really that's where you see people buying land. Uh, the first idea was to have people buy land with cash, but in those days, most people didn't have cash. Okay. And so it's been told that the people traded livestock, cattle, and things of that nature for the land. Oh. Yes, and oftentimes later on, just to have the land, oftentimes they would take back a note, a repayment note, so that the people could own the land and uh, start developing it. And the idea was eventually to pay the Holland Land Company back. Well, as you know, most things go, um, that didn't always work. And uh, there was some leniency there where you know, some people fell behind. But again, they were kind of relaxed as far as to the collection of those debts. And so people still continued to farm the land. Um, and at some point, uh, they realized that it was no longer practical to have the land office there. Uh, so eventually, the Holland Land Company, they sold off the rest of their assets. And I believe that was in um, the 1830s uh, that they eventually liquidated okay. the remaining land. Now, what that caused to happen was they would sell to non-residents of Chautauqua County. Oh. And so these were gentlemen that were, again, seeing a business opportunity, seeing a way to uh, make some money, and so they then would sell off the remaining land. Uh, there were some individuals, and of course, one of our more famous claims to fame in Chautauqua County was, we all know William Seward, uh, who was one of those individuals that bought a lot of land, the land company, he eventually came to be Lincoln's Secretary of State. Oh. And we all know Seward's Folly when he bought Alaska uh, as an investment uh, from the, I believe it was from, the, from Russia at that time. Oh. But he was a local local individual and so he, he owned that land. Uh -huh. Well, what happened was eventually Mr. Ellicott uh, retired. He was getting up in the ages. And so the local agent became a, a William Peacock. And oh, we've yeah. probably seen that name around here. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, he had his <laughs> land office. Uh, the funny thing was is that during his tenure, uh, people were starting to worry that these new investors who were not local residents would start collecting on these debts uh, that the other company had been kind of lenient about. Mm -hmm. And so what they decided to do 
is that they decided that they would storm the would be the county land office, which a local one was right here in the village of Mayville. And if you've been in the village of Mayville, you know where the vault is by the courthouse, that little kind of igloo looking stone building that's mm -hmm. in front of the courthouse. Mm -hmm. um, they decided to storm his office and burn the records so that if these new individuals were to try to determine who owed what, the records would be destroyed and there'd be no way of knowing who owned what and how much they owed. Oh. Well, ironically, the records had been moved to Batavia the year before, which would have been in 1835. So on February 7th, 1836, when this angry mob came up to destroy the records, there really wasn't much to destroy. They probably found some papers and things like that, but they, their purpose was kind of defeated, and so they, they caused more of a riot than anything else. And I was looking through, um, you know, it's been handed down to me, some of um, my ancestors' diaries and things like that. And I have a, oh, a great, great, great grandmother that goes way back a few years who was a young child at the time that this incident took place in 1836. And she remembers it very well. And in reading her diary, she said that Mr. Peacock actually had to be rescued by somebody who was a very large, kind of muscular gentleman and taken up the street to safety so that he wouldn't be harmed. Oh, okay. His, his wife, uh, and this is where she said in her diary, was that it was so, such a stressful situation to her that her hair turned white overnight. At least that's what the, the legend says. And so after this all happened, of course, really there was never really justice. No one was really ever arrested or held to account for their actions. Um, it was kind of uh, viewed as more of a, a rumble, so to speak. And so there was really never justice. But Mr. Peacock, he never really recovered from this incident because oh. he thought that uh, he'd treat people fairly. He thought that everyone was happy with their requirements. And uh, to see something like this happen, it was just, it was a shock to him. And so it wasn't long after that that he basically retired from his commission as agent for the Holland Land Company. And so that's a little bit of a nutshell, and I know um, that's kind of a very brief overview of kind of how it took place, but we kind of see now the progression of an obviously larger tracts of land were broken down into smaller tracts of land, and we kind of have now the situation that we see as far as what, who owns what. And so you figure with 360 acres in each lot, you can fit quite a bit of land in those, those residential areas in that land area. Did I cover that pretty well, or did you have any questions about um, that? <laughs> uh, uh, no, but um, it's pretty interesting, really. Um, so, uh, so what do we, uh, do we go from here? Um, uh, you said that Mr. Peacock never really recovered. Right, yeah, but by that time most of the land had been sold, so there really wasn't much of a need for a land agent anymore. The area was still very rural, and uh, for most of the 1800s, we were an agricultural society. And there's a couple of fascinating things about that, because uh, there, were, there were gentlemen, farmers, who would own hundreds and hundreds of acres of land. And again, they would grow crops, they would farm, they had dairy on that. And uh, obviously the need arose for certain um, requirements that they would have. And so you would see that uh, the old one-room schoolhouses that we've heard so much about. Oh, yeah, yeah. So these farmers, out of their 200, 300-acre pieces of land, they would carve off typically an acre or two acres, and sometimes they would have a school there. Uh, sometimes they would have a church there. Uh, sometimes a cemetery there. Mm -hmm. And what they would do is they would kind of limit its use so that uh, if it should ever cease to be a school, a church, I don't know how it ceased to be a cemetery, but if it should ever cease to, for its desired purposes, the land would revert back to them and it would essentially keep the land from being sold out from under them and being used for maybe for something else. And so oftentimes these conveyances, if I might say them, um, were never really recorded. In other words, 
to make it kind of official, you would take your deed, your document, and you would take it up to the county clerk's office, and you would memorialize it in the county clerk's records. Now again, we're going back to probably the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. We've become spoiled with our modern tra uh, transportation methods because it literally takes us, what, 35, 40 minutes to drive from one corner of the county to another. Mm -hmm. But back then, it was either horse and buggy, or if you were fortunate enough to live up maybe on the lake shore or down in the city, you could take the train. Mm -hmm. But those things were an all-day event. And it would take you all day to get to where you were going. And so it's kind of foreign to us because we can be somewhere quickly, do our business, and be home in just that short amount of time. But for them, they would get up in the morning, they would start their journey, they would take care of their business, and they'd be home around the dinner hour. So as you can see, it does not really lend itself for convenience to no. getting your deal no, no. <laughs> recorded. So a lot of those conveyances may never have been recorded, and you'll see sometimes well, they'll make reference to a school or to a church, and there's really no recorded instance of that because once the deed was given, it kind of sat in someone's chest of drawers or their, their cupboards or something like that, and so it never would get recorded. So that's one fascinating aspect of the agricultural version of that. Um, the other version, and this is something that we see from time to time, is that in the descriptions, you will see that oftentimes when a farmer deeded property, there was reference made to a cheese house. And so this is across not just our county, but most counties. And so the question becomes is why, did there, why was there so many cheese, cheese houses, houses back then? Well, again, we're thinking back then they did not have modern refrigeration. And so those dairy farmers who would milk their cows, um, unless they had immediate use of it or someone came to pick it up immediately, they had a limited amount of time to use that milk before it went bad because, again, they didn't have refrigeration as we know it now. And so oftentimes the distance to market would be too great. So what do you do with milk that you don't know what to use? You turn it, you churn it, and you turn it into cheese. And so they take it to the local cheese house, which was a lot closer, so they didn't lose out on their entire uh, harvest, so to speak, of the milk and the dairy products, and so they would make cheese. Okay, uh, the cheese houses, um, were they somehow kept cold? Uh, yeah, there was, there was some, again, uh, cheese, my understanding is, does not to be kept as cold as, like say, milk or cream or something like that. Uh, there okay. are cheeses that I hear in, um, in parts of Europe that are basically aged in caves. And of course, you know, a cave or a cavern uh, would, was it's fairly damp and cool. So it may not have been perfect temperature, but it was enough to keep the cheese cool. And of course, there was uh, ways of, of I guess again, harvesting ice when the ice was there, putting it, packing it in sawdust, keeping it a cool place so that you could keep it for a longer amount of time. So yeah, we, we missed on the fact that you couldn't open up a giant cooler and just plug in the yeah, uh, yeah. appliance. Yeah, I know there was an ice industry yes. on Chautauqua Lake. There was. There was, um, they called it the Lakewood Ice Company. Um, again, that's a part of history. And again, they would go out there in the, in the middle of winter with their saws, and they would cut these huge blocks of ice. I'm not really an expert on the ice cutting industry, but I'm putting a plug in. If you ever are interested in it, um, I've been to the Fent Museum in Jamestown. They have a nice slow display on kind of the ice industry in the area and what they would do to kind of harvest the ice, put it on the sleigh, take it off, store it, kind of pack it in there so it lasted for as long as ice would last under yeah. the circumstances. Yeah, there was, pe before refrigerators, people had ice boxes. Yes. And they would have to buy ice yep. uh, to put in, in there to uh, keep keeping the inside oh, of the yeah. ice box cold. Yeah, that's yeah. that's why, I you know, again, we <laughs> kind of take for granted that the conveniences we have because yeah. you think about back in those days even what would you do with meat you would salt and you'd smoke them because that would preserve the meat because you weren't able to refrigerate the whole you know 
mm -hmm. pork or whatever it was that you're trying to mm -hmm. preserve. And so they would do the, what they would, could do mm -hmm. to kind of make sure that they didn't waste or lose out mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. what they were trying to accomplish. Yeah, and then they, uh, that was prob probably had to do with um, canning vegetables. Yes. Uh, canning vegetables and fruits. Yep. Uh, that came before freezing. Oh yeah, Preserve and it, preserving yeah. it. And you know, there's no doubt because you think back in those days, uh, without again having the technology to do this instantly, this was one of those things where this is what you did <laughs> for your life, for your mm -hmm. for your life interests. Is that you, you were constantly working yep. uh, in in order to preserve uh, your life, basically. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. And so that was kind of the uh, that was kind of the the society that they lived in, uh, even up into the 1900s, where uh, there were still large farmers that with large tracts of land. Farm. We still have farmers in this area, but we've developed a lot more. The sort of fields, wide open fields, have been developed more into residential areas, and so we've kind of seen the the the, the changing, the involvement of that from being more of an agrarian society to being more of a a commercialized society, and uh, we've we've had a lot of industries in this county over the years. Um, we've had, um, of course, you know, Jamestown's known for the furniture. Uh, other areas were known for whatever they had locally, the grape industry, things like that, and they're all. But uh, it was a very rich area of the state, and in fact, when they were first surveying this land, they determined that the land in western New York was actually more tillable, more usable than the land just south of the New York PA border. And oh, so that's oh, that? really up mm -hmm. where the where the records came in. And of course we've got our claim to fame here. We've had individuals of some notation come through that, you know, uh, everyone knows that Robert Jackson, the Supreme Court Justice, oh, yeah. was from Jamestown. Um, there have been presidents who have passed through here. Um, Eisenhower, or excuse me, uh, Ray Roosevelt went to Chautauqua Institution. And years ago, um, the old, where the Jackson Center is right now, mm -hmm. um, uh, the individual owned the house at the time. Uh, president Ulysses Grant actually passed through there uh, during his time as presidency. So there's a little bit of a local history here. Um, we've got the benefit of having kind of the lakes and having the area there. Um, and so that kind of gives you an idea of where we came from as far as our our locations and our land and so anyone who sees a deed or sees their description will kind of understand a little bit of the progress that that made from the early times until now. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, so what happened after um, after we got past uh, the middle of the 1800s then? Well, the land started becoming more, again, developed as we talk about. Um, the land was broke up into smaller chunks. Uh, you think back then, there really wasn't the highway system that we have now. Um, there was basically trails, and in fact, a uh, very familiar area. Uh, the area between Bloomer Road and Mayville was a footpath for the longest time, and so for the, for the bloomers and the willets that lived out that way to get to Mayville, there wasn't a highway, there wasn't a road, it was basically a footpath. So you understand, those times, I, since it was not as developed as much, there was not as many ways to get around. Okay, so Bloomer Road was a footpath? Yeah, because we're talking 1840s, okay. 1850s, okay. long, long time ago. Um, and so you had your main, what, well, your main roads, again, they were just dirt, dirt at that time. Mm -hmm. So you had the main roads, you know, they called them the Jamestown Mayville Road or, you know, the, the Mayville Sherman Road. Mayville Sherman Road. Road, yeah. And they were your main thoroughfare, so to speak. And so, and of course it, it served its purpose because mm -hmm. there was not that many residents at the time. Mm -hmm. And so there was not the need for the side roads and the streets and things like that. But as the land was sold down smaller and smaller, access became more important. And so you see, it started seeing that there would be roads put into place, roads put in, and oftentimes you'll notice that the road was named for someone 
either who is right. the developer right. or right. someone famous in that area. Right. Um, yeah, uh, you said that there was a family by the last name of Bloomer. That's correct. And that's who uh, Bloomer Road was named after. Correct. Some people think that that's a funny name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for the name of the road, because they think about the old-fashioned uh -huh. underwear that was the boomers, to, yes. But then I think uh, somebody told me once that uh, actually the that kind of underwear got its name from being invented by somebody. By the way, it's possible name of bloomers. Yes. So, um, yeah. so anyway, just recently uh, somebody told me that. Um, when she'd first moved to Mayville, uh, she thought it was so funny. She was so um, amused at the fact that there was a road named Bloomer. Right. And then there's the Crawford Road yep. and the Bentley Road and uh, the Vanessa Road and yep. uh, out in that neighborhood and the Hannum Road. And those are all the last names of people who've lived right. and, you on know, those roads. A yeah. lot of those roads got the name for the fact is that they basically used by that particular family to get to the main highway. Oh, so uh, oh. again, uh, Bloomers had quite an acquisition of land out on that road, and so it became known as, known as the Bloomer Road. Mm -hmm. And um, most of the times that's where it was named after, was the way that they would access the way to the main road. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting because these roads, when they were laid out, uh, there was two different uh, widths of road. So if, the main roads, if I can call them the main roads, were always laid out as being one chain wide. So uh, a one chain, again, from our earlier conversation, was 66 feet wide. So like the main roads between Jamestown, Mayville, Mayville, Sherman, Westfield, uh, Fredonia, they were all one chain roads or 66 feet wide. Now, okay. obviously, if you went out there and looked, none of these roads are 66 no, feet No, they're not. Wide, not, but, not even now. <laughs> but the right-of-way, uh -huh. which would be obviously the side of the road and the shoulder and things like that, was intended to include that. The smaller roads, the roads were, which would get you, say, from point A to point B, were laid out as about 49 and a half feet wide. There were, there were smaller roads. And again, you look at these roads, they're not 49 and a half feet wide. But again, that in, entails what they call the the um, the right away the road the, the ditches and things like that. Now I failed to mention here that we were talking about u units of measurement mm -hmm. and the chains and the links. Mm -hmm. Well, there is also another unit of measurement that doesn't use used very often, but people might see it in their deed, and that was known as rods. Rods. Yes. Okay. Now a rod was sixteen and a half feet long. Okay. And so if you see reference to something that was two rods or four rods or six rods, obviously you just multiply that number by 16 and a half feet to get the total distance. I say that to say that that's where that 49 and a half feet comes from. Those rods, those, those roads would be three rods wide. Oh. So the three rods times the 16 feet, 16 and a half feet would be 49 and a half feet. So that's, that's why you see that. It seems, kind of seems a random mm -hmm. measurement, but that's where that came from because all these roads, these smaller roads, are meant to be three rods wide. Well, you know what my mother told me one time? Um, when she first uh, came to Mayville, when she married my father, uh, she said in the winter months, this was in the, like the middle of the 1940s, mm -hmm. she said uh, that they only uh, plowed the country roads, like Bloomer, one, enough for one car to go through, not a width of two cars. Sure. So in the winter, um, you might be up the creek, you know, if <laughs> a car was coming from exactly. the other direction. But then, of course, maybe not everybody had a car yet in the 1940s. No. I don't know. No. Well, it, it is, it is, especially out that way because, uh, you know, my parents have said before that, especially my mother who also lived out on the Bloomer Road, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it was a real spectacle to have a car drive by your house. And again, this would have been the 1940s, mm -hmm. late 1940s. And so I, I agree with you, probably not too many people drove their cars. If they drove them, they didn't drive them very often and so it was kind of like and there were dirt roads they were you know not much in the summer we got really dry they'd be dusty and you imagine how much 
dust would be raised by cars uh, constantly traversing those roads, those roads back and forth. And so they didn't really have that. But that mention about the snow plowing, and you think about how probably antiquated that snow removal. Snow plow equipment was, I know. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, we have always had so. the stories about how we used to snow back in the day and how the walls of the snow would be so high you couldn't see over the top of them. But it's, right. it's fascinating with the way that sometimes there was no natural windbreaker, and so the wind would pick up that snow and drift it into right, the road. And there right. are some spots that can drift pretty well right. over that way. So a lot of fascinating, but that's kind of really where the roads came from. And again, people would start building on them. They would start parceling off smaller pieces of land. And obviously, some places were more ideal than others mm -hmm. to develop what we call our villages and our cities. So as most cases were, the, were true, you built your community around some natural boundary line. So say, for instance, there are a lot of communities up on Lake Erie because they've got the lake right there. Mm -hmm. There are places down along Chautauqua Lake and along the Chattacoin because, again, it was a way to kind of ferry products back and forth. And so those were kind of the, if I can say, the, the concentration of the population was around areas where you could have a factory, where you could have a mill, or we could have some sort of uh, uh, receiving area for as a depot for crops and things like that. And that's kind of where the industry built up. And blacksmith shops and mills and things like that, they were prevalent at that time um, because that's kind of where the center of the population was. And again, you, you built your business based on your location and the convenience of it. And natural supplies were not in demand or were not in, you could, they were in great demand at that time. You had a great supply of them. So you could do that pretty easily without really having to go too far for them. And um, again, uh, the, the land records at the clerk's office, the clerk still keeps all the records from 1811 is when the deeds kind of start coming out until modern times. There's a record kept of all those transfers. And so someone, if they were interested in kind of finding out the kind of the progression of their property, they could run that property backwards to find out what large tract of land it came out of. And at some point, it came from that Holland Land Company that we've talked about earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, there was uh, something um, that my husband was saying uh, about um, sometimes uh, in earlier times that things like trees and rocks and things were considered yes. like, like borders. I'm glad that you mentioned properties. that because that, that's one of the things you'll discover about descriptions is that they used whatever they had. Now, uh, before I delve into that, uh, there are places in the county, and I talked about earlier about the survey that Joseph Ellicott did, there are places in the county where those monuments that he set are still there. Oh. Because what they want is they want a very precise definition of where their boundary lines are. And they're typically speaking, and I've never seen one in person, but oftentimes they look like uh, a little obelisk, you know, the four-sided with the point at the top. And that will mark the corner of a lot. Now, a lot of them have not survived. So you, you would think with all those right. lots. Right. You know, but there are places in the county, I don't have any off the top of my head, where they are, but you can actually go and see an actual marker. So that was the first part, is that you always defined your boundary based on where the markers or where the boundary lines of each of those lots were located. Well, obviously, as the land got smaller and smaller, you had to kind of use what was there. And so, for instance, you might have a piece of property, and we've seen these before, where there's no set dimensions or distances. It might start at the corner of the blacksmith shop, it might run up to an old chestnut tree, again, down to a stone that is set in the corner of the property, over to a stump, and then back up to the place of beginning. Now, we're talking probably at least 150 years ago, mm -hmm. those circumstances, so that blacksmith shop, is that gone. chestnut tree, <laughs> they're all gone. That rock, probably somebody moved it. Yeah. <laughs> But that's how they would define their boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so it became a little bit of a nightmare to try to figure out what was intended to be conveyed. And so what surveyors would do at that time 
is they would say, okay, so here's what they were intending to convey, an acre, two acres, three acres. So what land are they actually occupying? And so they would set up lines of occupation. So you know your neighbors to the north, east, the road probably is to your south, and you're able to determine kind of roughly sketching out where your lines would be to give you the acreage that you bought, and then that way you could come up with some sort of dimensions. But yes, that was very common back then before surveyors because you think about two people who are interested, one buying and one selling, didn't really want to enlist someone to measure out the land, they would walk the land. And they would say, I want my boundary land to be here, here, and here. They would shake their hands, they would exchange money. Again, talking earlier, sometimes the deed would be recorded, sometimes it wouldn't be recorded, and they would go on their way. And it was very less formal than we see it now because Again, it was more of a gentleman's agreement as yeah, far as the, yeah. to determining what land they would buy. So, uh, yeah, that, I think that it was, was simpler. Life was simpler. It was a lot simpler. <laughs> you know? It was a lot simpler. They did not um, have the same distractions mm -hmm. that people have today. And of course, again, really in a way, they were self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, they were able to provide all the their needs, whether it was clothing, whether it was shelter whether it was food, they were able basically to provide their own needs. And uh, you might meet up with your neighbors, you might discuss the weather at the time, whatever they discussed back then, but yeah, you didn't really need to be uh, complicated in your business relations. No, no. Everything is pretty complicated that way these days. Yeah, yeah, and, and of course, you know, the, uh, the population has increased, obviously. We are a lot larger than we were 150 to 200 years ago. Uh, so there's been the need for that. But um, there was a very much a sense of community in that area. Um, if you've ever read any of the local town histories, uh, they're quite fascinating because it was basically a group of individuals with similar interests who would meet together. They would kind of form like a, a loose community of maybe government or supervisors and they would kind of all work together with their farms um, to kind of for the, for the public good and they would if there was an issue whether they had to go before a court or something they kind of handled that amongst themselves and of course that was many years ago and but that's where kind of where you see these families that got together they got along and they worked together and if you read these town histories you'll see a list of maybe a dozen families that were larger in holdings and larger in name, that they were kind of like the foundation, the bedrock of that particular community, and they worked together. Hmm. Yeah, you know, um, I've heard that there were even people that lived in the, down, in the gorge area. It's very possible. The old <laughs> Chautauqua Creek. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah I, I don't know how you would get any building supplies down there, but it's very possible that you could construct some sort of a, a shack or a shed down in there. And of course, again, um, it's kind of a natural waterway, um, and it, it kind of you know comes from you know from Lake Erie, and it kind of is a natural boundary for people to kind of invest in and to explore. So it, I could see that. Mm -hmm. I could see that. Yeah, and then. Um and, and then there were bridges across the gorge where there's, the roads are, are mostly all dead-end roads yep. now that come to a dead end on top of the gorge. There used to be bridges yep. that went across the yeah. gorge. Yeah, there, there's a lot of them. And of course, you think about it, that would require there to be a sort of a natural uh, uh, tie-in from one road to the other. Uh, and if you look at a map, it's interesting to see that as you say, the Chautauqua, what they call the Chautauqua Creek, mm -hmm. was a divider between properties. And if you look, there might be a road that dead ends. And if mm -hmm. you cross over, you see there's another road that kind of picks up uh -huh. and continues yeah. on. Uh, yeah. If you look, you were talking about the Bloomer Road. Mm -hmm. And if you follow that across, because that dead ends at the Chautauqua Gorge. But if you look at a map and you go across, that, that's kind of the boundary line between the town of Chautauqua the town of Westfield. Oh, so oh, if we really? were able physically to cross from Bloomer Road over the gorge, you'd be in the town of Westfield and there's another road that picks up right there. And uh -huh. I can't remember the name of the road. I've seen it before. Um, but um, it's, it's... Yeah, a, I'm, 
I, I did know what the name of that road is. It's not popping into my yeah. head at the moment, though. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, and, and there's other places where, and there, there's been more modern examples of what you're talking about. Uh, we were talking about the farm roads. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, if you happen to live in those days before the, uh, either the New York State Thruway mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. Southern Tier Expressway came through, uh, a lot of times uh, land was appropriated from you to put these super highways, oh, you know, throughways yeah, in. Yeah. And oftentimes they were farmers, whether it was up on the lake shore and they were grape farmers or along the southern tier and they were regular farmers. But in, sometimes in taking of the land, you would have- Taylor Road. Taylor, thank you, yes, that sounds right. <laughs> okay, he looked it up. Oh good, that's perfect. I know we have the T. <laughs> so what happened would be is that there would be roads that farmers would use, they were dirt roads, and suddenly they would be cut off. There was no way to get across that road because now the throughway or the expressway ran, right? So if you go up, especially out toward like Ripley, Westfield, you notice if you're driving Route 20, a lot of those roads dead end because there's no way to cross the throughway at that point. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you would lose the access mm -hmm. to the other side of the road because you couldn't physically cross. <laughs> right. I don't think right. it'd be advisable to try to cross with a tractor or any other implement. Yeah. That very busy <laughs> thoroughfare. So you'll see roads like that that were cut off because of more of the modern conveniences of putting in a highway or a throughway, which was a much more convenient way to travel longer distances, longer places. Right, right. Yeah, I, I remember seeing somebody. Um, it's kind of... Um, on the outskirts of Erie, I can't remember the name of the road, um, it's a way that you can uh, turn to go to, like, uh, get down in the neighborhood of Hammett Hospital. It's yep. sort of a new road. Okay. And uh, I remember one time you were talking about you probably wouldn't be crossing, like, the thruway <laughs> or something. I remember seeing a man one time crossing that busy road and he was running really really you would have fast to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you would have to but you know it's important sometimes we, we talk about access mm -hmm. um we we run into that a lot in our kind of our industry it's important that people be able to get to their property now oftentimes um, if your property was cut in half by a by a roadway or something you still want to be able to access the lands because it's still of value to you if you're raising crops or grapes or something like that. You still want to be able to get to that. Now, you couldn't do that with a throughway, mm -hmm. but oftentimes a lot of the utility lines, like back in the day, Niagara Mohawk, when they were getting ready to put in their, their lines, mm -hmm. they would basically buy large tracts of land from farmers to run their line. Well, the farmer typically would do what they call, they would reserve a farm crossing. A farm crossing. A farm crossing. And it basically allowed them, usually in one spot, a crossing over this easement or right of way or strip of land so they could access their land on the other side. And it was agreed upon by both the company and by the owner of where that would be. Um, they would do that with railroads too as well because again, it was important for them, that was their livelihood. Right, if you couldn't right. access your land and take cattle back and forth, you lost out a lot on your investment in your land. And so, uh, very important that you were able to reserve that. Now, it doesn't work with the highways because again, it would be too dangerous to try to cross over there. But with some of the other areas where it was not as well traveled, you could still get to your land um, without really offending the, the owner, whether it's an easement or a mm -hmm. railroad of some sort of way. Yeah, like I've heard people use the word easement from time to time over the years, and mm -hmm. now I now that talking to you, I know what they mean. Yes. You know? Yeah, well, so. there's, there's importance to it. Um, not everyone is blessed with having the road access. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people, and you've seen houses that are tucked back in the woods or up in oh, the fields. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they don't necessarily front right on the road, and so it's important for them to be able to reserve, again, some sort of a right-of-way or an easement so they can drive all the way back to their cabin in the right, woods or their right. 
their yeah. chalet or whatever the case may be. Right, right. So, um, yeah, because without that, unless you own a helicopter, there's not many ways that you can <laughs> get to your house in the woods, your cabin in the woods. Yeah, n not a lot of farmers, even these days, don't have um, <laughs> helicopters. No, <laughs> no, no. So... Yeah, so that, that, that's a factor to consider, um, is that most people, and we were talking earlier about the, the highways, you can see the necessity of laying out what they call maybe sub-roads. So yes, you've got your main roads, but what if you built a house on some farmer's back 40? Uh, you would want to be able to develop a road that would connect your house to the main to the road. Main road. And um, it's kind of fascinating because if you ever look at an aerial view of our county or other counties, most roads are laid out in a grid pattern, squares. Mm -hmm. So you know that if you're on this road and there's a road that's parallel to you, if you drive a little further up and you cut across the connecting road, you should be able to, to meet up with that road that runs parallel. That's the nice thing because it's kind of hard to get lost because every yeah. road sort of runs into roads. Yeah. Uh, you, before you and I came on the air, I was talking about the differences between the, the north and the south. And from the mid-Atlantic to the New England states, most towns, villages, cities are laid out in a grid pattern, which is very convenient because you know that if you're on 1st Street, then 2nd Street should be the next, and 3rd Street, so on and so forth. But down south, they use a lot more of their natural geographical boundaries. So there's no square blocks. Oh. <laughs> so if you see a road that's parallel, well, parallel, I use that road roughly. But if you see a road that's kind of running alongside your road, and you think to yourself, well, I'll just continue on this road, and eventually we'll meet up, it may never happen. It may never happen. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes it very difficult to get around because you don't really have turn left, turn right. It's kind of a bear to the right, bear to the left. And yeah, I, I know that when we've been riding uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, you know, going from place to place. There's a lot of, it seems like there's a lot of wilderness area, mm -hmm. like in Pennsylvania so yes. far still. So, um, so uh, I mean, very beautiful, right. of course. Of course, it's pretty mountainous. That's the thing. That's yeah. the thing is you'll, you'll notice that in the development of this area, the ease of development played very greatly into who settled there. Now, uh, if you go over toward Cattaraugus Allegheny Way, there's a lot of wilderness still out there. You know, you've mm -hmm. got the Allegheny State Forest. Right. You've got a lot of the preserves there. And it boiled down to the fact is that because you've got the mountainous area in that area and the, the river that runs through there, it wasn't easy to develop that land for farming mm -hmm. like it mm -hmm. was in kind of the lower areas. Now, again, mm -hmm. very beautiful land very recreational in its nature, mm -hmm. but not really convenient to uh, try to build a business out of it. And so no. there's those areas that are still very much wilderness mm -hmm. uh, for those enthusiasts who like to go camping and hiking. It's kind of a haven for them to be mm -hmm. able to do yeah. that. And yeah. uh, But very, very beautiful part of the, the country. Um, you know, we, we sometimes, if you've ever been away from this part of the area, and you've been out west or down south, and you mentioned that you're from New York State, people automatically assume... That you're from uh, New York City. <laughs> I know, I know. I remember uh, years ago, uh, when I was maybe 19 or 20 years old, I remember one time somebody uh, who was visiting the area uh, from another state was... Uh, she was referring to the fact uh, you don't uh, talk like you're from New York, and, and she'd been thinking about having heard uh, the kind of accent that the people out at that end of the state have, and right. we're here way in the western, southwestern corner of New York State where our accents are completely different from, from the New York City, right. um, uh, Long Island right. accent, you know. So yeah. I have kind of a funny story about what you're talking about because when I was down south, I met someone who, when they asked where I was from, of course I just said New York, and they said, "You are from New York," and I said, "Yeah," and they said, "You seem really polite to be from New York," <laughs> and I said, "Well, I'm not really from the city. I'm from as far west as you can get from the city and still be in New, New York, York State." <laughs> yeah. 
So that, that assumption is there, but yes, there are other places. Yeah I, yeah, I guess there are people that think we should all have that accent, or uh, and I, I've just heard that recently that a lot of that a lot of people in other parts of the country do think that all of New York is right. like oh, yeah. New York City. So yeah, and here we are out in the boonies. <laughs> you know, really. and like I said, as far as remote as you could possibly get, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. farmland and. Well, you know, what I like about the neighborhood that both you and your family and me and my husband live in is it feels like we're way out in the wilderness. We can't see each other's houses from our yards, and yet we're only three miles from right. town. You know, it's you couldn't find a more perfect location. Oh, yeah. You know, if you needed something from town, yeah. you could get there quickly, but it... It just feels out in the wilderness feeling, so it, it's really a nice location. Yeah, and I, I think that really, in a way, a lot of people, that's the, the draw of the smaller community because you have a way to kind of withdraw. If you work in a city or a you know, town or something where there's mm -hmm. a lot of activity, it's a way to kind of retreat from that busy lifestyle um, and kind of have your own little quiet place to kind of unwind after a day of work. I think oftentimes that uh, for people that basically work and live in the same area, you never really get away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a, a madhouse rat race type environment. But if you have that ability to kind of withdraw from the business where you can come in the evenings and on the weekends where it's not that hectic lifestyle, but you have the convenience mm -hmm. of being close to both commodities and mm -hmm. businesses mm -hmm. and conveniences, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, we are very uh, fortunate to have that kind of a setup because oftentimes we talked about before, there's people that don't have the opportunity to see the sites mm -hmm. that, that we see. Yeah, one time I was having, when I was over a few, a couple of years ago when I was over at the Chautauqua Institution one day and just happened to be having a conversation with somebody who'd come from some other part of the country uh, to spend a week at the Chautauqua Institution and I said well the scenery is so beautiful out in the country I told them you shouldn't confine yourself to just the institution for the week you're here you should see about getting out and driving around mm -hmm. on the country roads and he said to me um, you don't understand he goes where I live the rest of the year there are people who are willing to murder you for only five dollars. He goes, just staying here in this gated community uh -huh. for a week feels so safe to me. I, right. I mean, you know, even though Chautauqua County is a, a relatively safe place sure. to be, um, you know, he couldn't see going out in the country and uh, riding around, you know, it's just so, um, but you know, I felt like in a way, like he's missing out on so much, like not visiting the country right. roads and everything. You take that for granted. Uh, I, I had when I was still kind of uh, in my uh, in, instructive, informal places of trying to find a place to work. I actually lived in Minneapolis oh, did for you? two years, yes. And of course, I'm a small town boy mm -hmm. going to a big city. and. You know, it's so different because, again, you have to lock your doors mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you kind of have to make sure that you know what time of the day you're walking mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. where you're walking and to be able to return here and not have to really make sure that I had to be inside by dusk or by dark or making sure that everything is locked up tighter than a drum. It's something you take for granted, uh, being able to live in the area that you live in with, again, not to say that everything's perfectly safe all the time, mm -hmm. but that you have a, a much more of a sense of security mm -hmm. in your surroundings, more of right. a comfort. Right, right. And again, we take that for granted because not everybody can just go out of doors anytime, anywhere that they want. Randy, um, you are so knowledgeable about all of this. I'm going to have to have you come back oh, that's on fine. again, but I'm afraid to say we've come to the end of another episode. Well, thank Fresh you. Perspectives. Thank and you for having thank me on the show. Thank you for coming on. It's been a lot of fun. And I will see the rest of you in the viewing audience on the next episode in a couple of weeks.